Well, thanks for all of you who made it this morning. We're pleased to see such a large audience. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Michaela Vanon Aliata, who teaches English literature at uh, the University of Venice, Kafoskari. Um, Michaela has written on the relationship between literature and the visual arts on Gothic and fantastic literature, and more recently on James Joyce's poetry and trauma narratives. She has written on James Joyce, and Henry James, uh, Stevenson, the Brontes, and uh, Mary Shelley, as well as um, Margaret Atwood, Coetzee, and William Trevor. She has edited and translated Le Fanu's Green Tea in 2010, and more recently she edited a volume, The Haunted Minds, oh, the Gothic and yeah, yeah. Fantastic Imagination, which is a monograph, sorry, no. and that was in 2017. And today Michaela is going to uh, tell us about trauma narratives, especially the representations of individual and collective trauma, and Patrick McGrath's Trauma and Don DeLillo's Falling Man. So the floor is yours, Nicola, and we, I look forward very much to listening to this fascinating talk. Okay, shall I hold it? Yes. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Patrice for the invitation. And so I will start right away and um, by telling you that uh, both McGrath and uh, DeLillo's uh, novel are two narratives of uh, trauma. They are, in other words, an attempt uh, to confront, uh, to face the, the aftermath of two dreadful events, uh, the Vietnam War, and the terrorist attacks uh, on the World Trade Center on September 9, 11, 2001. In both novels, uh, trauma is staged at uh, both at an individual and collective level. The Vietnam War, as you know, lasted over 20 years and was the very first war that America lost. So that was the first where veterans did not find a welcome on their return. 50, 80,000 were killed out of 2,700,000 who served. The human cost it exacted on the other side was enormous. It, has, it is estimated that there were over 5 million Vietnamese casualties, the majority of which were civilians. In 2001, when four passengers airliners crashed into the towers, so did Americans' confidence in global preeminence um, so did, sorry, the uh, confidence in Americans' uh, global preeminence, revealing the 21st century as an age of terror, but also, as we will see, of retribution. Over 3,000 lives were lost. Most of the bodies were not recovered as they were either turned to ash or buried forever. The um, McGrath novel is uh, structured as a confessional narrative, but also as a sort of uh, psychological thriller. It is mainly an exploration of memory, of suffering and self-delusion. More than anything, as the title unequivocally, unequivocally um, indicates, it addresses the psychological experience of trauma and the connected issues of survival and guilt. 
the Lilo's Falling Man portrays the social and especially psychological fallout from the terrorist attacks when Americans were plunged into a state of despair of utter shock. It focuses on Keith, a lawyer and a poker enthusiast who manages to escape from Ground Zero wandering, injured and confused to the flat of his separated wife, Liana. In the days and after the planes, this is how in the novel the attacks are referred to, they always talk about the planes. Uh, so in the days and years after the planes, they, they try in a way to rekindle the ember of uh, their marriage, but eventually they drift apart again, neither able to fully articulate their trauma. Now, before um, analyzing these two novels, I will make some preliminary observations on the notion of trauma, which is a key issue both for psychoanalysis and history. The term, uh, which comes from the Greek trauma, means wound. And it has been long used in medicine to designate primarily an injury, a physiological injury, a physiological trauma, and its effects on the organism as a whole. When the concept was adopted by psychiatry, it retained the original meaning, though referring to a wound inflicted upon the mind. According to the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, trauma pertains uh, to experiences where an individual witnesses an event that involves actual or threatened death or serious injury to one's physical integrity and whose response must involve intense fear, hopelessness or horror. Uh, so trauma which uh, was identified as a factor triggering, triggering sorry, neurotic symptoms such as amnesia, dissociation, dysphoria, hallucinations, hyperarousal, numbing, social withdrawal, and uh, most importantly, suicidal preoccupation in response <coughs> to natural disasters, combat, rape, torture, is an event defined by the victims, by the individual incapacity to respond adequately to it and by the long-lasting effects it brings about in the psychic organization. In 1980, in 1980, the American Psychiatry Association classified all these symptoms, the one I've mentioned, as post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, Freud first developed uh, a theory of uh, traumatic neurosis in Beyond the Pleasure Principle in relation to the death drive as the outcome of a breach of the protective shield or defense mechanism leading to a compulsion to repeat. He famously, Freud famously argued that the forgotten, shocking, traumatic event returns after a period of latency, a temporal delay, the victim gets away from the scene of the accident, apparently uninjured, since the event is not experienced as it occurs, 
but is fully evident only later in connection with another place and in another time. Freud so posits trauma as synonymous with the period of amnesia, of latent memory during which the source of the originating trauma is not, cannot be available to the sufferer's memory, to the victim's memory. The effects which can be traced to this shock are later revealed in the form of compulsive repetition and displacement. Displacement, a whole set of severe psychical symptoms which constitute an attempt at both warding off and controlling the memory of a passively experienced overwhelming incident. Central to the experience of trauma is the feeling of helplessness. Its most critical aspect, however, as Freud uh, brilliantly suggested, is survival. The, an experience which, as we will see, is crucial in both novels. It was Freud, so in his attempt to account for the symptoms of shell shock in soldiers during World War I, who provided an illuminating insight into the relationship between trauma and survival. And here, I, this notion was uh, elaborated by Kathy Caru, uh, Caruth. You have it here, Unclaimed Experience, a Trauma Narrative in History, um, who's one of the leading theorists on, in trauma studies. The fact that, and you have the quote here, for those who undergo trauma is not only the moment of the event, but the passing out of it that is traumatic, that survival itself, in other words, can be a crisis. A uh, McGrath novel is set in a pre-millennial pre -millennial New York, at the time when the teen twin towers were under construction. And obviously this is an allusion to the collective trauma of 9-11, which is at the core of Delilo's uh, uh, novel. While reconfiguring American recent history itself as a trauma that needs to be acknowledged and to work through, uh, McGrath gives added complexity to his novel by having it told that the first person narrator is uh, Charlie, is a psychiatrist, is a doubtful and, as we will see, himself impaired psychiatrist, who increasingly finds himself uh, suffering from the same symptoms, from the same pathologies he diagnoses in his own patients. The narrative shifts back and forth, uh, providing frightening hints uh, both of Charlie's sadistic mother, an unstable, hard-drinking woman, as well as of Charlie's self-deception and false memories. Whenever he tried to help her to defend his mother, she would uh, turn on him for interfering, snap that he was, and I quote, always trying to help the people who don't want it, unquote. By contrast, uh, Charlie's uh, elder brother, Walt, on whom their mother lavished all her affection, predictably emerged from this uh, uh, background unscathed, eventually becoming a successful artist. And these are the words of the mother. Anyone can be a psychiatrist, she said. 
It takes talent to be an artist, unquote. Now, the choice uh, for Charlie's profession appears to be no surprise given his highly dysfunctional family. When his father left his mother for a much younger woman, Charlie took care of her. His precocious caring disposition is signaled in the very first uh, uh, paragraph of uh, the um, novel. My mother's first depressive illness occurred when I was seven years old and I thought it was my fault. I felt I should have prevented it. Uh, Charlie uh, later establishes a connection between his early experiences of rejection, of abandonment, and the choice of his profession. And he says, you have the quote here, I choose this line of work because of my mother, and I'm not alone in this. It's the mothers who propel most of us into psychiatry, usually because we failed them. <laughs> Poor thing. The role of the therapist uh, appears to represent uh, a, um, a way for Charlie of dealing with guilt regarding his unconscious aggressive impulses towards his abusive mother. And the anxiety is uh, transformed into a desire to heal, which may result in an overzealous need to cure his patients. By the same token, it seems that Charlie's feelings of omnipotence, as well as his unacknowledged wish to manipulate his patients, are the real uh, motivations for engaging this um, profession. Consistently with the uh, assumptions underlying trauma therapies, uh, Charlie believes that recovery requires uh, to engage emotionally with the trauma memories through storytelling. By reliving the emotions related to trauma, the memory of trauma can finally be understood. Among Charlie's patient is Elena, an attractive young attorney who as a child had suffered, quote, sustained sexual abuse at the hands of her father. Like many victims of uh, um, sexual childhood sexual abuse, Elaine experiences dissociation, a disruption in the function of consciousness and memory, a phenomenon common as we will see to trauma survivors, which serves as a means of self-protection against the horror of the abuse. And here you have the quote, when her father came in, she went out by which she meant she left a body. She became expert at dissociating from the experience and watching as though from a high place, the corner of the ceiling, she said, what happened to the girl on the bed. However, the central case around which uh, the, uh, the plot, an entire plot of McGrath's novel, revolves concerns the uh, veteran, the Vietnam veteran, Denny, the brother of Charlie's wife. Charlie runs group therapy session for veterans in an old city hospital. And in this, uh, McGrath was influenced, you have it here, by a famous uh, psychiatrist, Robert J. Lifton, the author of the book, Home from the World, Vietnam Veterans, Neither Victims Nor Executioners. Um, and this book was based on the experimental meetings uh, uh, during, uh, um, in which veterans uh, talked uh, through uh, their experiences during and after the war. McGrath, uh, with a really surgical precision, 
recreates the despair and rage the survivors had to bear. Their bodily postures and facial expressions are a text in which can be read all the survival conflicts, death anxiety and death guilt, suspiciousness and psychological numbing. I see them grinning as though for a group photo, each of those emotionally shattered but still defiant men, men in their twenties, mostly with seeing what no human being should ever have to see, and the pain of it is stamped on their faces like boot prints. They seen their bodies die and wanted to know why it was not them. They felt defiled, they felt many of whom that they were already dead. This is what also happens to the victims of the Shoah, obviously. Denny is, uh, as McGrath says, uh, the worst damage of the group. He suffers from all the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorders. His looks uh, betrays uh, uh, the vigilance uh, of, uh, no it's not here, of, the, of a man um, who expects at any moment, I quote, to be ambushed, sniped, booby-trapped. He's an alcoholic and he constantly flashes back to the war. I quote, he could not help it. In his mind, he was still in the jungle. In his nightmares, and here's the quote, the Vietnamese had killed the rose out from the earth and came after him. Night after night they came back. He was pursued by the running corpses of his victims. I could still smell their bodily corruption in the room. And here one can see at play uh, the mechanism known as acting out with a self-destructive behavior to, uh, through which the victim returns to involuntarily to the moment of crisis. According to Dominic La Capra, um, and this is his most famous book, Writing History and Writing Trauma, uh, referring, he, he says that he refers to Freud's distinction between melancholia and mourning. And he argues that trauma, if not confronted critically, that is to say, if it is not worked through, trauma works like melancholia, an arrested process in which the traumatized self is possessed by the past and remains identified with the lost object. It is especially Danny's confession that he didn't want to come home alive that points to the drama of survival trauma. He had watched his body bleed to death in an ambush, and after that loss, I quote, he had shut down his humanity. So Danny is a victim who has also become a perpetrator. Realizing that Danny had gone a worse, uh, through a worse ordeal than the others, Charlie forces him to bring to light uh, the source of his trauma, which midway through the book is revealed to be cannibalism. A revolting practice and along with incest, one of the central taboos of Western culture. And obviously this shows to what an extent the dehumanization of the war was internalized by its victims. Unable to cope with the atrocious memories is a psychiatrist as an earth, Demi blows his brain out. As uh, Lifton uh, observed, killing Vietnamese enabled men to cease feeling themselves guilty survivors and impotent targets, and to become instead omnipotent dispensers of death who had 
realized their mission. Uh, what happened is that Dennis' suicide is a traumatic experience for his psychiatrist. It brings an end to his marriage. It compromises entirely his professional career. And his emotional involvement with the Dennis memory intensifies it to the point that he completely identifies with Danny, feeling precisely as Danny had felt. Not, you have the quote here, not truly alive, already dead then. As uh, McGrath said in, in an interview, Dennis' suicide for which uh, Charlie holds himself responsible and sets off a traumatic reaction in him. Indeed, uh, the novel illustrates not only Charlie's eventual coming to terms with his unrecognized uh, uh, trauma, but the way in which trauma may be induced by the perception of another wound by the identification with another's traumatic story. The novel reaches its denouement in a remote valley in the Catskill Mountains where Charlie has found a new job in a decaying Victorian asylum. It is here that we will be confronted with the dire reality of his infantile trauma. It was his mother who wanted to kill him and not his despised father prevented her from doing so. So the memory of his past returns to play him and it takes shape in the form of an old photograph. What is interesting, and this is also true of Fallen Man, since the traumatic memory is fixed on an iconic, not on a linguistic level, images play such an important role in the trauma representation that it is probably in the image that the psychic registration of trauma resides. It is not surprising that this older photograph triggers a crisis by bringing forth Charlie's long buried trauma as well as its resolution. So the experience of being threatened to death by one's own mother is a trauma not only in its sense of power, utter powerlessness, but in the possibility of assimilating the truth of what was happening without feeling annihilated. Hence, the recurse to displacement to the, which is obviously a uh, defense mechanism. Unthinkable that my mother could do that to me. The unconscious would not sanction it for a moment. So he got displaced on Fred. Fred is his father. He never calls him by name. He only call, calls him Fred. Um, so faced with this revelation for a moment, uh, Charlie contemplates suicides, but then he thinks about his daughter. Yeah, you have it. I was thinking about Danny, how he had been sitting on the floor under a window when I kicked his door down on that, that Saturday morning in the summer of 1972. Our situation was identical, the booze, the waking trauma, the gun. I sat, Leia, sat like that for several minutes. Then I thought of Cassie, his daughter. I struggled to my feet from the back of the door. I threw the gun out in the snow. When my mother pulled the trigger that night, how did she know it was not loaded? Did she know? Did she care? So here we can see how trauma can be, remo can be removed, not through forgetting, but through a process in which the past atrocities can are acknowledged. 
as again uh, La Capra claims, in this way the drive towards the self-destruction is uh, superseded by working through tra trauma where one is able to remember what happened in the past but realizes is living in the here and now with future possibilities. So of Charlie's final decision to entrust himself to a psychoanalyst illustrates the successful, which is not what happens in the next novel, the successful process of working through traumatic experience. And he also reiterates a motive running through the novel, the importance to recover memories. Now, I will analyze uh, uh, briefly Fallen Man, the, uh, starting with some consideration on <coughs> the title. The title, as you <coughs> probably know, refers uh, to Richard Drew's uh, famous photograph of the fallen body of an, an ident unidentified man who jumped from a window of the South Tower on the morning of 9-11. Set in a stark relief against the rectilinear grid of Taz, the man appears arrested in the middle of a high dry dive. is upside down, hands at his side, one leg bent, is caught in a pose of stillness, falling to his imminent death. This uh, photograph, uh, which captured one of the many who plummeted from the towers rather than a burn, was published, but then it was soon <coughs> excuse me, withdrawn from circulation. <clears throat> a narrative was created by the media and also by the politicians that on that horrible Tuesday morning, nobody died by their own hand. Many photographs and video footage of the planes slamming into the sides of the towers were not censored, unlike this picture. They all depicted death that, however, was in a way sanitized death. Death we could not see. So it was as if it did not exist. <clears throat> and this is perhaps what made it acceptable for those images, for those uh, uh, videos uh, to be viewed. Drew, Richard Drew's photographs instead is a visual evidence of despair, of helplessness. And so it was suppressed because it contradicted the, the dominant, uh, the prevailing um, rhetoric of America, the brave, which focused on the heroics of 9-11, on resilience and heroism as the steel frames of firefighters risking their lives <coughs> to rescue civilians. So to suppress this image was the deliberate attempt to suppress a too traumatic memory. The inclusion of this picture, which actually gives the title to De Lillo's novel, and the reference to a fictional performance artist who suspends excuse me, himself from buildings, uh, bridges, in the very same position as the man in the um, 
in Drew photograph uh, while wearing only an invisible harness, people can't see it, show the Lilo's wish to challenge the dominant narrative created by the media and politicians, the refusal to acknowledge the place of memory in their attempt to move forward into the future. Lian, the um, separated wife of Keith, of the protagonist, encounters him for the first time um, at the Grand Central Station, 10 days after the attacks. She looks uh, over, overhead, to see him upside down, wearing a suit, a tie, and dress shoes. He brought it back, of course, those stark moments in the burning tires when people fell or were forced to jump. In addition, uh, by giving voice to the fictional terrorist Hamad, one of the 19 hijackers who participated in the suicide bombings, Delillo humanizes the man behind the attacks, overcoming the clear demarcation between self and other, friend and foe at the core of President Bush's famous speech, uh, you know, the axis of evil speech. Yeah, I'm sure you all remember. Nine days after the attacks, uh, President Bush warned the nations to make a decision, and I quote, either you are with us or you are with the terrorists, unquote. Many passages in the novel point to a mad temptation to stray from his mission, to stray from jihad. So he secretly harbors doubts about jihad. He even entertains the idea of marriage and children. He has an overwhelming desire, as we read in the novel, to be simply normal, which he knows he must resist. So by incorporating narratives that emphasize a plurality of viewpoints, Delillo avoids a typical victim oppressor, good evil binaries, encouraging readers to enter the terrain where victims, survivors, and witnesses of tragedy actually meet. The novel begins with a, really a powerful, um, evocative uh, rendering of the collapse of uh, the North Tower, leading us uh, through an apocalyptic scenario where a survivor who turns out to be Keith, the protagonist, walks down the street in a daze, uh, his body completely covered in ash and blood. It was not a street anymore, but a world, a time and space of falling ash and near night. The roar was still in the air, the buckling rumble of the fall. This was the world now. Smoke and ash came rolling down streets and turning corners, busting round corners, seismic tides of smoke. Otherworldly things in the morning pour. The world was this as well, figures in windows a thousand feet up, dropping into free space. He walked slowly, watching for something he could not identify. Everything was grey, a city somewhere else under permanent siege, and a stink in the air that infiltrated the skin. He looked into the haze, seeing the strands of bed filigree that were the last standing things, 
a skeletal remnant of the town where they'd worked for 10 years. The dead were everywhere, in the air, in the rubble, on rooftops nearby, in the breezes that carried from the river. So as a Keith emerges from the rubble, and I quote again, he tried to tell himself he was alive, but the idea <coughs> was too obscure to take hold, unquote. When he hears the sound of the second fall in the trembling air is a perception of reality of the world outside him alters dramatically and language itself seems to disintegrate along <coughs> with the towers, the most prominent icons of the Manhattan skyline. Now, the, the fall of the towers symbolized the end of the American innocence in the sense of naivete, not of mere moral purity. Like the biblical Tower of Babel, the crumbling of the buildings seemingly built to, to embody the ultimate manifestation of American domination showed the fragility, if not the vanity, of that shrine to technology and capital might. If terrorism, as many have argued, is also a response to the, um, not only the displacement, but the atrocities created by global intervention, by global exploitation, it is no wonder that the World Trade Centers were chosen as targets for violent retaliation. Now, the incomprehensibility of suicide terrorism on account of its indiscriminate nature intended to kill anyone within the range of the explosion and of an account of the willingness of the perpetrators to die by their own hands, and most people were very young, is an evident, is, sorry, it's an, it's an event clearly encoded in terms of trauma. In addition, suicide terrorism provokes horror, not only because of its inhuman devastation, but because it violates the corporeal limits of the self. Attackers and victims' bodies are confounded. They commingle with each other. When Keith is being checked, is in the hospital after um, uh, goes home, is being checked by a doctor, is being checked for signs of organic shrapnel. And he learns that, uh, here you have the quote, in those places where it happens, the survivors, the people nearby were injured. Sometimes months later, they develop bumps, for lack of a better term. And it turns out this is caused by small fragments, tiny fragments of the suicide bomber's bomb body. The bomber is blown to bits literary bits and pieces, and fragments of flesh and bone come flying outward with such force and velocity that they get wedged, they get trapped in the body of anyone who is in striking range. Now, as in uh, uh, McGrath's uh, uh, novel, the form of a fallen man is temporarily disjoint, temporarily disjointed. It moves back and forward in time, ending at the very beginning with Hamad, the terrorist, and Keith's storyline violently merge as the suicide bomber crashes with the plane 
into the tower in which Heath and his friend Ramsey work. Between these two narrated events lies the bulk of the novel, which is split into three parts with three separate sections. Uh, realizing that the briefcase he took with him while evacuating the towers is not his, um, Keith decides to return it to its owner. It's a woman in her mid-40s, Florence, another survivor with whom he has an affair. Although the relationship is brief, it shows how traumatic events can create a strong bond between people. The affair is most therapeutic for Florence. It gives her a chance to narrate a trauma to a sympathetic listener. And it is thanks to Keith that Florence can cope with a trauma. Keith in instead remains withdrawn. His attitude is marked by a sense of derealization and affective disengagement. Haunted by his colleague's death, is plagued by grief, by survival guilt that manifests itself in his refusal to accept the fact that he is alive that the city is alive from the destruction he has witnessed. Now, everybody in the novel is uh, traumatized. Uh, um, Keith's wife, Liane, is also traumatized. Uh, the, the shock of seeing her husband narrowly escape death is only one trauma Liane has to process. Her father committed suicide when he was diagnosed with senile dementia. So you can see how the centrality of memory to the narrative is illustrated by this and also is illustrated by Lian's engagement with the performer artist Fallen Man and through her interaction with uh, a group of Alzheimer, uh, Alzheimer patients uh, uh, that she leads. Uh, Keith and Leanne's son, Justin, Justin, is also affected by the attacks. With his friends, he peers out of the window with binoculars, waiting for other planes to hit. In the children is an Im imagination, Osama bin Laden, which is anglicized as Bill Lawton, Lawton, I, I should say in American, is stalking the globe in bare feet, long white robes, while the towers are still standing, but are under imminent uh, threat for more planes. And so this in a way I think shows a Justin uh, effort to efface a traumatic reality through the creation of an alternative narrative. Uh, Bill Lawton is a ghostly entity with a paradoxical ontological aspect. is both unseen and seen and unseen and indeed, uh, the various actors in the novel are uh, pitted against not only uh, the effects of uh, disasters, uh, but also with the fantasies those uh, uh, effects engender in their imagination. Uh, gradually, Keith abandons, um, abdicates, is resumed uh, family life. Unable to sustain the weight of his trauma, he looks for oblivion and partially relocates in Las Vegas to the hyper-real Las Vegas to pursue his career as a professional poker player. Now, I just make very briefly, I'm, I'm almost finished, 
and two observations on games of chance. Poker obviously is a game of chance, not a game of skill. Games of chance, according, uh, there's a very interesting book, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, um, Edmund Berg, I think it's translated from German, it's called The Psychology of Gambling, came out in 1985, and he says that games of chance are for losers, who know they are losers, and thus, in a sense, uh, they have uh, both uh, the excitement of possibly winning and, more importantly, a way of gaining mastery over losing. Now, gambling, uh, which is often uh, pursued to overcome states of dysphoria, depression, promotes an illusion of control, which brings us back to what I was saying at the very beginning about, uh, about trauma and feeling of powerlessness. So it promotes an illusion of control, the belief that one can exert a skill over an outcome that is actually defined by chance solely by chance. So in Keith's decision to flee uh, the, um, the, uh, the place, uh, to flee New York City, uh, the place associated with the trauma, we can read an unconscious desire to disappear like the other victims, to evade the nightmare of history, the constant presentness of the past. And so this is again is a typical mechanism of self-protective denial. It's a, what is called avoidance co coping, a deceptive quest for compensation against trauma's devastations. So Keith Thade recovery measures the depth of its suffering his inability to work with trauma. Now, uh, though brief, uh, I'll say two things more before uh, getting to the end. Though brief, the narrative which focuses on the extremist side, I think is the most riveting. Delillo imagines what might be going on within the circle of a group of Muslim terrorists who later will carry out the attacks. Hamad, the fictive member of the group, is a young Arab living in Germany. His story strays from his study at the Technical University in Hamburg, where he meets his guide, Amir. The name Delilo gives to the real life, you have it here in the picture, to the real life uh, terrorist, Mohammed Atta. That was his name. He played a key role in organizing uh, the, um, the attacks on 9-11. So we see him from his study at the Technical University uh, in Hamburg to Nakomis, Florida, where he undergoes a flight training, and finally to his participation in the attacks. And so this section narrates Ahmad's gradual integration into the Islamic cell, his introduction to the violence of war, the necessity of martyrdom, I quote, the glory of self-sacrifice. Um, yet Ahmad, uh, whose thoughts are rendered in, in free, indirect style, is not so wholly indoctrinated that he cannot give a consideration to whether, here you have the quote, does a man have to kill himself 
in order to accomplish something in the world. And at one point uh, there is a conversation with the Amir, uh, the spiritual leader, and he asks, what about the others, those who will die? But as he gradually surrenders his uh, individuality, Ahmad imagines his life gaining a purpose larger than life. And I quote, he wore a bomb vest and he knew he was a man now, finally, ready to close the distance to God. Ready to close the distance to God. Um, a few months after the attacks, uh, Delilo wrote uh, a um, very important essay, which is called In the Ruins of the Future, Reflections on Terror and Loss in the Shadows of September. So both in his essay and in Falling Man, uh, Delilo wants uh, to challenge uh, the binary division between us and them by underscoring the effects of global capitalism, the discrepancy between Americans' wealth and the dispossession of the uh, dispossessed. As we read in the novel, one side has the capital, the labor, the technology, the armies, the agencies, the cities, the laws, the police and the prisons. The other side has a few men willing to die. The last section of the novel in the Hudson Corridor takes us inside the hijacked plane. And Lilo, in a way, tries to represent the unrepresentable, the unspeakable, the horror of the moment of the impact in the towers. Because indeed, although the entire world witnessed repeatedly through televised images the crash, we never saw it from the inside. Having just sprayed the cabin, um, the inner cabin with tear gas, Hamad waits for the crash, repeating to himself, forget the world, recite the sacred words. And so these are the last moments we witness in Hamad's eyes before the narrative returns to Keith for the last pages of the novel. And Delilo begins to describe the roll and spin of a bottle on the floor of the aircraft, becoming more and more agitated as the plane accelerates and then rips inside into the uh, tower. The blast wave explodes through the building sending Keith out of his chair and uh, into a wolf, a wall, sorry. His face, I quote, warm with the blood on Ramsey's shirt, blood and dust. So the novel ends at the very beginning with uh, Keith's journey from his office where his friend, Ed Ramsey, had died in his arms to the streets where he sees the fallen man, the, uh, the most uh, iconic representation of the horror of that day. Keith's exposure to the spectacular devastation of the attacks seems uh, to have created a rupture in his experience, both of time and space, a rupture that has also severed the relationship between identity and memory, language and reality, precipitating a crisis of signification where actually no words, so this is what he says, make sense. So eventually, um, as we know, he will recuperate from his wounds, from his trauma, but he will not find compensation for his loss, for his psychological uh, wound, wounds. The line of fire trucks and the student in now headlights are flashing. He could not find himself in the things he saw and heard. The two men ran by with a stretcher, someone face down, smoke seeping out of hand and clothes. 
It was the move into this time, the distance. That's where everything was all around him, falling away, street signs, people, things he could not name. Then he saw a shirt come down out of the sky. He walked and saw it fall, arm waving like nothing in his life. Thank you. These are the very last words. Well, thank you very much, Michaela, for this uh, very uh, interesting paper. I learned, I learned so much, and of course, I'm sure uh, my colleagues and myself will have questions. Um, should I start maybe with a question? And then, oh, Pascal already yeah, has a question, so I'll ask my thank questions. Thank you very then. much. Oh, thanks to you for listening. I hope I didn't bore you, but... No, no, no. <laughs> I worked on uh, trauma narratives, actually. Oh, I see. Ago, so uh, that was very, very interesting. Um, my, my question, if you don't mind. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a very basic question, but why did you choose to study uh, McGrath and Delillo together? Because, for instance, there are other uh, writers, uh, well, American writers, who uh, work, I mean, American novelist who wrote about the Vietnam War. I'm thinking about uh, Tim O'Brien, for instance. Yes, so that's right. So, what was your? Uh, can you explain? Can we oh yes, yes, of, of yes. Studying the two yeah, 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 yeah. No, because as a, uh, maybe I said in the very beginning, I mean, behind the Grant uh, uh, novel is the Vietnam War. All right. So, I mean, we have uh, two wars. And, um, and there are many, many affinities. Actually, McGrath himself wrote, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, it's a collection, I think, of three stories. It's called uh, Stories from an Anthem Here and Now. And there is a story which deals specific, specifically with the 9-11. But I thought that the, the idea of history itself, how history itself, the Vietnam War, and the um, attacks on 9-11, which is configured, is encoded in terms of trauma, I thought it was very, very interesting. Do you know Tim O'Brien? Have you read his book? Yes, did yes, I, I did. I, I know. I did. I haven't read anything by McCrone. No, no, it's a very, it's a very um, gripping, I think, uh, book. And also the reason, sorry, I also forgot I think I told yesterday, um, Beatrice, the reason why I picked up a fallen man was because last year there was the 20th anniversary of the attack and it seemed to me right to bring these uh, two novel, uh, novels uh, together. Okay, thank you. Oh no, you're very welcome. Well, uh, thanks again, because I learned so much. Uh, contrary to Pascal, the trauma narratives is not one of my specialties. So I'm quite new and discovered so many things. Uh, I was interested in what you said about the link between trauma and melancholia. Yes. Um, and, and the, no, the mourning and melancholia. That's the difference. Oh, okay. And the, yeah, I mean, the La Capra, yes, yes. So Yes, yes, yes. Well, La Capria says that, I mean, the, um, the two mechanisms with which usually victims or sufferers deal with trauma. One is acting out, that is to say, being a prey of past memories, uh, having hallucinations, sometimes committing suicide. And this is a very destructive um, sort of mechanism to deal with trauma. The other one is to work through, that is to say, to talk about, to create a storyline about what has happened, possibly, obviously, with the help of someone competent uh, who guides you through that experience. And in this way, the trauma may be acknowledged, not just being repressed, right? So Dominique Lacabre says that if trauma is just acted out, if it's not properly worked through, which is the only successful way to overcome uh, the T 
terrible anxiety, it brings the terrible feelings of, uh, of powerlessness, of um, anguish, is uh, the same difference between that uh, Freud who wrote this essay which is called Mourning and Melancholia. Melancholia is a superficial way, like acting out, of dealing for instance, with the loss of uh, a dear one, right? Where the, the thought of someone who is lost is always, always there, but it's not really worked through, it's not elaborated. Whereas a mourning is a process by which obviously you grieve over the loss of a dear one. You grieve, but then you understand, as uh, uh, Dominique Lacabra says, you understand that, that that experience has been worked through, is over, and you can even face the future. You're not fixed on the lost uh, object. And uh, I don't know if I made myself clear, but uh, summing up, but this is uh, the core of, uh, of his argument. And indeed, in, in McGrath's novel, uh, obviously, Charlie, the psychiatrist, blames himself uh, for the way he has uh, probably, um, he was not a very um, uh, successful and a delicate enough way he uh, wanted to have Danny talk about his experiences. And obviously, the atrocities he had committed, I mean, the thing that we read midway through the book that he ate the dead. It's something absolutely unheard of. So the, the moment he verbalizes this utter experience, he just cannot bear. And indeed, he commits suicides. And this, as I said, triggers a traumatic reaction in Charlie, who, by the way, is a very sensitive, knowing uh, psychiatrist. What is interesting is that, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the fact that um, Patrick McGrath's uh, father was a very, very famous um, psychiatrist. He was also the superintendent of the, the last, uh, most security asylum hospital, you know, for people insane in London, Bradmore. So he grew up actually there. So is a, pardon? It helps. It helps. <laughs> yes, I mean, if you read Asylum, is very uh, most uh, is most uh, famous uh, novel was a bestseller. Uh, it's all about uh, something he, mm, you know, he heard uh, uh, one of the tapes he heard from uh, these uh, um, um, patients. Uh, what I was going to say, so, no, I said it's interesting, uh, the, the fact that in the novel, a psychiatry is, on one hand, is uh, denied as a mastering discourse, but it's also supported and it's also welcomed as a way that helps uh, people to deal with these uh, very, very traumatic experiences. And, uh, again, uh, Thank for the question, Pascal. I mean, uh, when I was referring to also um, Bush's speech, it was, you remember, it was really a war. Uh, that was uh, really the idea. And, uh, but the, um, the, also the inflammatory rhetoric actually was also based on this idea that America, yes, was wounded, was hurt, but it was not defeated. Well, to follow on what you said uh, just now about George Bush and the famous speech, I was wondering if, uh, in a way, uh, Delilo's book, with its sort of multi-vocal, it's not really a multi-vocal uh, multi narrative, but in a way it is, because uh, we have different, different versions of the different yes. perspectives. If it was a challenge to this sort of uh, American Manichaean vision of, you know, oh, yes. as exemplified in the speech, the axis of veto, yes. and you're with or against, uh, do you think Delilo has this uh, sort of political stance? 
Oh, it does, it does. I have not talked because I didn't want to be too long. There is a character in the novel. Everything, actually, I forgot to say something. Not only everybody's falling, disintegrating like Keith, you know. His life is falling apart, his marriage life, etc. But uh, there are two other important characters. One is Lian's mother, who actually fades. Eventually, she dies in the novel. And her longtime lover, who has a double name, Martin, but actually a section is called Ernest Heckinger, I think you say it in German. He was involved in the, in the past in the, uh, in the commune. Um, and so there was a liaison with the Bader, uh, Bader Meinhof. And apparently, it seems, he's an, he's an art um, dealer. And it seems that he also was a financing, a financing with the stolen art, some of the sleeper cells, okay? But at one point in the novel, and indeed this character seems to speak uh, through the Lilo, unlike Lian's mother, he wants to understand the political, even psychological realities of non-American people, what is behind you know, this small group of men who, as I read before, are willing to die. And um, whereas uh, his mother, uh, uh, whereas uh, Lian's mother, Nina, who is a very sophisticated academic, and she's an art historian, and there is a beautiful conversation they have between the two Morandi, Giorgio Morandi still lives, when, you know, you have this, um, lifeless uh, objects and they talk about obviously the attacks and she has uh, uh, she supports in a way the uh, Bush administration uh, rhetoric whereas uh, uh, Martin a lover as a more nuanced uh, as a more uh, complex I would say um, view of the events and also the fact to have incorporated in the novel the point of view of Ahmad, who is a character uh, which elicits actually both condemnation but also sympathy in the reader. He has this desire to be normal, he sees a girl, and you can see one day is in a supermarket and the girl, you know, and the cashier smiles at him and he seems happy at that, and, you know. And you see how he's been led away by uh, this uh, terrible, empty rhetoric of his guide. And um, so uh, it's a very, um, I mean, you, you both obviously, you condemn, but you also sympathize with this guy, who's also, actually, another thing I didn't say, is an outsider, even in the a small community. Even when he goes, he doesn't seem to share, you know, all the prescription of the very strict Muslim religions, growing beards and all that. Eventually, he will cut his beard and dress Western um, clothes only when he prepares for the attack to to be, as he says, invisible, to be no one. So definitely there is a political stance, absolutely, yes. Although he does not make a very, you know, overt statement. It's implicit. Well, thank you very much. And I have maybe just one remark that would tie in with Pascal's question. I was intrigued in uh, uh, this fact that you described that I never thought of, but it's so shocking in a way. You know, these body fragments oh, yes, uh, mingling in case of an attack. And that, that reminded me of the uh, occasion of rape that is so present in uh, Delilo. So uh, maybe the, the, the two uh, traumas could be the, uh, uh, the attack on the bodily integrity of oh, a person. Oh, yes, yes. Rainbow through. Yes, you know. by all means, by all means. Yes, I entirely agree. Yes, absolutely. It's called organic shrapnel. And this is, again, a testimony of how 
as I said about the violation of bodies and how they commingle, you know, it's uh, just astonishing, yes. If you don't mind, please. Um, at one point, you mentioned the role of images. Uh, can you uh, clarify this? Uh, what type? Well, this use of figuration in from my narratives. Uh, in these particular two, what 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 kind of? Uh, no, what I meant is that trauma, by definition, is an experience which cannot be organized on a linguistic level. To begin with. Yes. To begin with. But it, uh, there is a very important, I, I can't remember whether I mentioned it, uh, Lackhurst, uh, I think it's called uh, the trauma question. I can't remember. But it seems uh, uh, what uh, uh, this uh, scholar argues is uh, that um, uh, the trauma um, is uh, fixed on the image. And indeed, in both novels, the image is so important. We started with that famous photograph, you know, Holy Man by Drew. Because, as I said, trauma cannot be articulated in words initially, but uh, uh, in both novels, when uh, uh, Charlie sees this old photograph that shows him with his father, his mother, and his brother, it all brings back to the, the photograph, the image, encapsulates, it fixes the very essence of trauma. And indeed, traumatized people usually are haunted, yes, by memories, and those memories are more organized on a visual than on a verbal level. This expression of uh, trauma through metaphors, in particular, since the symptom is a metaphor, so in the text, it well, it's uh, uh, often rendered by means of uh, of uh, images and metaphors, in particular. And I was wondering whether there was, this, in particular, each novel uh, used a particular metaphoric field, if I may say so, or. or the, the, whether there was, there were, um, yes, um, metaphoric um, undercurrents, or I don't know. Am I clear? I'm not sure I am. Um, I'm not sure I quite am. Um, no, I'm, I, I'm afraid I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Whether well, one of the, actually, in as far as, no, maybe I, I do get what you're saying, and thank you for also this question. I think that in uh, Delilo's novel, um, as I said, Elian, Keith wife, is uh, leading this group of Alzheimer patient. Alzheimer could be viewed as a metaphor for the post-9-11 condition, in the sense that we cannot know what the future holds for us. We know that as Alzheimer's patients who have these memory lapses, that it cannot resemble the past. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think that that could be taken, Alzheimer's illness, as a ninth dementia, as a metaphor for the post-9-11 condition, mm -hmm. state of affair. I think, uh, I think what it is, as far as the other novel is concerned, uh, at this moment I cannot think of anything so uh, specific. Uh, mm, no. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. Well, unless there are more questions. We think we can now uh, thank Michaela Vanoa well, Thanks to you. Thank you, so thank you for having me here. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much.